Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part three of the Stimulant Use Disorder webinar series. We're really happy to have you. Um, today's series will concentrate on implementing EBPs to address stimulant use disorders. Our speakers today are Todd Mulfenter, Brian Hartzler, and Dina Vandersloot. Um, just a little bit about the ATTC. Um, we are funded through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, part, we are part of the ATTC network, which has been around for 25 years. Um, who we serve, the Great Lakes ATTC serves Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. The Northwest ATTC serves Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Sorry, Oregon, Oregon is Wisconsin. Uh, some housekeeping details. Um, this webinar will be recorded. Um, recording and PowerPoint slides will be available on the Great Lakes ATTC and the Northwest ATTC websites. Um, their websites appear on this slide. Um, this webinar does not include CEUs. Um, just a couple more housekeeping. Um, today's audio will be broadcast through your computer speakers, so please make sure that they are turned up and on. There is no call-in number available. Um, and please use the chat box for questions or comments. Um, we will, because there is a lot of um, information to get to, we will not have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but there will be an FAQ document um, with the questions and responses that will be available online. So our first speaker today is Todd Mulfenter. Um, Todd is the director of the Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC, and is a senior scientist at the Center for Health Enhancement System Studies, or CHESS, at the UW-Madison. He's also the direct deputy director for the NIATEX program within the center and has spent the last 20 years studying, planning, and leading system and organizational change efforts. So Todd, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Ann. And once we get our, my slides up here. Very good. So we, yeah, we, so, so through the webinar series, we, we started with Rick Rawson. Um, talking about evidence and, and background and, and sort of the state of the art around uh, treating stimulant use disorders. Uh, in the second webinar, second uh, webinar, we, we talked about uh, some case examples or presented some case examples around how, uh, how different organizations around the country are approaching stimulus use disorders. And, and in this one, we're, we're going to continue that conversation and, and have a, a bent to, to the conversation around uh, using implementation science to, to get some of these evidence-based practices implemented. And so the part I'm going to talk about is just some basics around implementation science as they, I think, as they apply to the evidence-based practices we're going to be talking about here. And, and then uh, Brian and Dina are going to get, get more more uh, specific around uh, uh, contingency management and the matrix model. Having said that, oops, having said that, so treating uh, stimulant use disorders, a, a few things I think that are worth saying up front. First, there's no evidence-based medications for stimulus use disorders, as, as, as we most of us know, um, but it's it, that's a really big deal considering uh, for opioids and, and alcohol use disorders, that, that medications are, are a central part of treatment. However, uh, not to despair, uh, ma the matrix model it has been shown to, to really have some, some good effect through behavioral therapy. And a component of that model, uh, contingency management, it more recently is showing some very good promise around the treatment of stimulant, stimulant use disorders. And so, with those two evidence-based practices in mind, let's talk about some, some implementation impl implications. And, and the big thing with both of them is, and, and I think it's important 
for us to think about as we go to implement those is there's both clinical and administrative issues there. And uh, I think just to, just to train and mentor on the clinical part is, is not going to completely address uh, the, you know, some of the needs in implementing both of these, both of these practices. Uh, we're going to take it from an implementation science perspective, and, uh, and really uh, the things we're going to talk about here are evidence-based practices around implementation, and then a lot of them are just, a lot of these are just sound practices that, that have been very helpful with implementation over the past couple decades. And, and so with that in mind, I'm, I'm going to take it from from what they call the CIFR model uh, that Dan Schroeder has put together. And, uh, and, and in that model, what she's done is has five categories that, that tend to be uh, very important to implementation. And what I'm going to do is cherry pick a little bit uh, pieces from the different categories that I, that I think are, are important to addressing matrix, uh, the matrix, implementing the matrix uh, the matrix model and contingency management. In doing that, I, I have to say I'm going to steal some from uh, Everett Rogers. I mean, for those who are out there that are interested in implementation work, uh, this is a great text. It's a little, it's a little dated. I think the most recent version was was you know published uh, 2012 or so, but uh, very good foundational work and, and a lot of the elements of Dan Schroeder's model comes from this text. Okay, so let's talk about characteristics of innovation. That, that's one of those Dan Schroeder categories. And, and with matrix model, contingency management, both uh, things that you want to think about as you're either implementing for the first time or, or trying to, to make it, you know, increase the fidelity of those models is keep it simple. Uh, particularly with the matrix model, can get pretty complex and make it as simple as you can. As you do either approach, uh, strongly encourage the, the use of data to show, sort of show the relative advantage. You know, within your programs, for those of you who are, who are attending from programs, you know, to have some retention data you know, as, as far as how your services, how people are doing with initial engagement, engagement first 30 days, and, and, uh, and, a, and completing therapy, length of stay, things like that, or length of treatment. Um, compare what you're doing in these, with, with any of these new practices. Compare the data you have from that to the data you've had historically and, and use that as a way to sort of continue to adapt your, your approach and try new things and, and really you know, don't don't implement the practice for implementation's sakes, but implement it so it is actually improving care. And uh, and, I'm, and and certainly there's other other you know other measures you can do around that. And um, and then another you know key key trait or or, or or component for Everett Rogers is the whole observability and uh, and really make it so so people can, as they're doing these, they can observe other people who are, who are doing it with fidelity or be observed and get feedback. You know, all these things I think will help with, with implementing these practices. Um, other things that are really important for anything you're, you're going to implement, um, but, but these practices in particular is, you know, she would say the inner setting, but we'll just call it the organization, <laughs> of where, wherever you're doing this. And this, the, 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 key, the, the key importance of leadership, and, and you're like, oh, yeah, of course, I hear that all the time. Leadership is important, uh, but, but, you know, things that you can specifically do around leadership is, is to have an executive mandate where you have a key leader or two that, that really endorses it, and then have a key leader or two or a key clinician or two as well that really can be the champions for this. Uh, I mean, those, those things really are important for any kind of evidence-based practice you're going to implement, whether it's around, around contingency management, matrix, um, MAT, motivational interviewing, you, you name it. And, uh, and then lastly, have a, a change agent. 
you know, this is another Everett Rogers piece, you know, and, you know, if, if you were to read that book, he, 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 he's, he's, he's entirely focused on Iowa farmers using drought resistant seeds. And he's sort of taken that and, and really uh, made it really helpful for us to understand other things to implement. Uh, in, in your setting, you know, having a person who's a change agent, I think in Niatex we call it a change leader, but, but someone who can really keep things going and make sure that, that the, what you're implementing is going to stay on task. Uh, individuals involved, that, that's another one of um, J.M. Schurter's categories. I, I think um, the, only, the only point I'll, I'll make there is, is training alone is not sufficient. I think training is, is necessary and not sufficient as well. And, and so to have ways for people to, to learn skills in addition to the training is, is really important. And, and again, find and cultivate those champions. Um, other you know, uh, things to do if you're, if you're having issues with buy-in, which is often the, the case with some of these, is, is use things like motivational interviewing, the same things you're, you're using in, in some of your therapies. Uh, that use that as a way to sort of advocate for the practice and, and to get people behind it. And then academic detailing too, that's, a, that, that's an approach that pharmacy reps honestly use with physicians where they really will sit down and, 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 and have just a basic approach where they use data and stories to, to, to really um, provide you know, rationale for, for why a, a given medication or practice is, is more important than, than current practice. Moving along, uh, the implementation process. Uh, one must first learn by doing, for though you think you know it, you have no certainty until you try. You know, conduct, conduct walkthroughs, conduct simulations, uh, role play, do what you need to do to give people a chance to, to test these practices. And, and test them in a way where it's a test. You know, it's not, you know, with contingency management, often you have to, you have to try that a few times just to get it working right in, in your culture and your, in your setting. And, and so, you know, don't be afraid to say, hey, we're going we're gonna to try this, you know, and, 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 do some, and do some tests. I mean, that, I think that, that, will, that will create the best result probably for your organization in the long run. Uh, use a, a structured change process whenever you can. Uh, sort of the, the latest and greatest for a lot of implementation people is Saldana with their stages of implementation. You know, those are listed here. You can easily look those up online. I, I think what I like about a structured change process is sometimes, you know, if people are going to implement an evidence-based practice, they're like, okay, we're going to do this training, and, and then we're set to go. And, and I think if you have a structured change process like this, you, you, you start thinking through some of the other elements that are, that are really important to uh, getting a practice effectively implemented. Um, other things to do, think about in the implementation process, uh, learn from others. I think, you know, what we're doing on this webinar today is important. Learn from colleagues and peers who have implemented this. You're, with both of these practices, you're not the first. Uh, set targets to be able to evaluate how you're doing around fidelity, around performance. Uh, you know, are people staying in treatment longer? Are, are other kinds of desired outcomes being achieved? And, uh, and again, you know, pilot test and, and test these as you go along. With, with the whole implementation piece as you, as you approach it, um, you, know, imp, you know, implementation is a science. I think all these things I've mentioned have different uh, evidence bases behind them. Some of them hopefully are, I know probably you're thinking, well, quite a few of these are intuitive, and that's good. It's good that they're intuitive because they're not practiced by all. And, uh, and, and really, as you go, uh, always err on the side of making things easier and, uh, and, and really be, be open to, to re removing barriers as you go. You know, just 
with both these practices, you can spend a lot of time planning. I think some time planning is good, but with some of it, you, you need to try it and, and really work on it as you go. And, and so to, to provide some more specific examples of, of issues around both these practices, uh, you're going to have uh, Brian and Dina to talk about that. I believe I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Hi, this is Ann. I'm just going to do a really quick introduction of Brian, and then we will turn it over to him. Um, so Dr. Hertzler is a senior research scientist at the University of Washington Alcohol and Drug Abuse Institute and the director of the Northwest ATTC that provides workforce development activities for the Region 10 states of Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, trained as a clinical psychologist, he has a wealth of experience providing educational and consultative services, services to health care organizations and the workforce they employ. Over the past 15 years, he has conducted several NIH-funded studies of dissemination processes for empirically supported behavioral therapies intended for people with substance use disorders. During that span, he received a K-23 Career Development Award from NIDA, specifically focused on disseminating, disseminating contingency management to addiction treatment community. Among his current projects is a co-investigator on a NIDA-funded trial that is testing strategies for implementing contingency management at 30 opioid treatment programs in New England. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Ann, and thank you, Todd. I really want to thank also everybody at the Great Lakes ATTC for their invitation to co-sponsor this webinar series over the summer, um, Stimulant Use Disorders and Services for um, uh, for that condition, um, and uh, of course today for serving as our administrative host as well as the, the prior installments of the series. Um, so what is contingency management? Um, that may be a term that's familiar to uh, people out there. Um, sounds like kind of a technical term, but um, I suspect that many people, even if it's unfamiliar terminology, are probably using some contingency management principles and relationships and everyday activities they have in their lives, whether that involves a pet or children or students that you mentor. Um, and I guess the uh, common, common language or elevator version of a definition for contingency management that I would offer today is that it's the use of behavioral reinforcement to shape another's behavior. In the context of addiction treatment, we're really talking about shaping clients' behavior to increase their adherence to treatment, whether that means taking medications that are prescribed, as prescribed, uh, attending scheduled visits, um, or those types of activities. Um, also, of course, abstaining from substances that have been problematic in the past. Those are all uh, common measures of treatment adherence. Um, and I think one of the things that, that may just be worth saying here is that um, this is difficult work that the, that the workforce does. Obviously, the audience is probably comprised of lots of people that don't need to hear that from me today. But it's difficult work. Uh, contingency management is, is not meant to be something where we are bribing people to do things that they don't want to do. But rather, this is really an opportunity to use positive reinforcement to increase their engagement in the good therapeutic services that already happen in treatment settings and an opportunity to increase that engagement and thereby um, optimize therapeutic impact so you're walking down a pathway to recovery with your clients. So that would be um, a, a way that I would conceptualize the use of contingency management in addiction treatment settings. I want to take a quick step back. I know Todd already mentioned some of the prior points made uh, by uh, speakers in our previous installments, uh, the contingency management did come up a couple of times. Uh, once with the, or, uh, in Dr. Rawson's initial uh, installment, he talked at some length about uh, the long-term cognitive impacts of stimulant use. And I think his exact words when it came to contingency management were, were that it breaks through the cognitive sludge. Uh, 
to back that up, I uh, am also citing some work there that's a review paper written recently showing that contingency management when paired with community reinforcement approach is the single most effective behavioral treatment for stimulants. Uh, it's similarly effective for those using cocaine or methamphetamine. I think Dr. Rawson also mentioned that contingency management's been heavily studied and I found a recent review uh, published earlier this year that shows 648 unique publications. So this is something that's not, not uh, been avoided by the scientific community. It's certainly been well studied. And despite that, we still have somewhat limited rates of adoption and implementation in the addiction treatment community. So still working on how to get this into the hands of the good people to, to, to use it effectively uh, with their clients. Moving on to the second installment, we heard from Drs. D. Felipez and PV about specific contingency management protocols. We heard um, uh, a big dose from Dom about the prize-based protocol, sometimes called the fishbowl protocol, originating with the late uh, Nancy Petrie, a great idea and very popular protocol in which treatment adherence is rewarded by draws from a fishbowl for people to win a chance at prizes of varying magnitude, small, medium, large, or jumbo, I guess, almost like you see at the carnivals. Um, uh, this was something that Dom uh, described as an implementation process that was successful in a nationally linked set of 30 or 35 veterans hospitals across the country. Um, and uh, again, um, I, I think uh, a really nice example of a successful large-scale implementation effort. I think Dr. Peavy also talked about a protocol, probably more in passing, but a voucher-based protocol that's built. It was actually a, 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 an implementation trial that I conducted at Evergreen Treatment Services, where she works, here in Seattle. Um, and that's, the, I, that's based on the work of Steve Higgins and folks in Vermont um, from back in the 90s who had an idea about escalating systems of vouchers, so vouchers for goods or services that serve as the rewards for treatment adherence, but where the the value of the vouchers would escalate over time to perpetuate a pattern of behavior change in the direction of treatment adherence. So we did that. I think that sometimes is a um, uh, people are weary about the costs of such a protocol. I will say the, the, the protocol we ran here locally in Seattle in an opiate treatment program uh, was one that, that came in at about $50 a head or $50 per, per client to do. Uh, so it was quite a bit more cost, cost effective than some options that have been tested in the past. Uh, we did find that that was um, effective in increasing counseling attendance among a very difficult group of uh, newly enrolled patients, polysubstance using patients, uh, that increased their counseling attendance by 15%. Some common features that are important here about both of these uh, implementation efforts, both, both local and national, were that they had some common elements. First, that leadership bought in from the get-go, that there was foundational training for staff, that there was designation of staff as internal champions to drive a local process, and that technical assistance was provided, or at least the availability of technical assistance was provided. And so, so we think about training and technical assistance, those are both uh, really important activities that tend to focus on staff, and I guess what I would say about them is that it's very important for people to become knowledgeable in an evidence-based practice, but more than that, what we really need, and in contingency management this is true as other behavior therapies, we need to be able to provide opportunities for people to uh, develop skills to enact the kind of communication-focused um, uh, aspects of a therapeutic method like contingency management. So to put a face on that, that's really about learning to contract with your clients about what reinforcers will be and what the what, and how they will earn them. It's about engaging them in proximal goal setting so that they can can look ahead and see what what uh, reinforcers they can earn in the near future. It's about providing them the reinforcers that they've earned in a timely manner, and it's about providing. Uh, social reinforcement and encouragement to continue them in their efforts to do so. So that's a bit of the kind of therapeutic uh, uh, inner workings of contingency management models. So we've got these successful examples, both local and national, of, of implementation success, and yet not a lot of uptake in the community, and why might that be? Well, I, I would say that part of the problem here is that we've got a lot of 
academicians who are still fighting over what the perfect solution is. And maybe if someday we find that perfect protocol that somehow that will get widely disseminated for use in every treatment setting in the world. Um, I think that's probably an overly naive sense of how um, real-world clinical practice works. Um, and I think what we have after 50 years of studying contingency management is a whole range of options. I've mentioned two of the most common or prevalent options in prize-based and, and voucher-based contingency management, but there are countless uh, contingency management uh, protocols other than those that are, are no less empirically validated. And the few that I'll mention here are step care models of uh, Robert Bruner and, and colleagues that developed out of Johns Hopkins University where people are rewarded for treatment adherence with uh, lesser treatment requirements, kind of a progression to a more autonomous uh, phase of treatment. That's also a contingency management um, application. Uh, the whole notion in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there were tons of clinic privilege-based um, contingency management protocols where people would earn either uh, preferred appointment times or access to supplemental services or preferable uh, dosing regimen uh, aspects to their medication prescriptions. Uh, these are all things that, while not all of them may, um, may be in current use, they're all empirically validated contingency management uh, applications, as, a, as is the work of Ken Silverman um, and his employment-based CM, where people are reinforced for adherence uh, with time-limited or per diem employment opportunities. Um, Steve Lash's work at the, the Salem VA in Virginia, where he reinforces veterans uh, for their aftercare participation with status tokens like coins or medallions or certificates of achievement or affirmation ceremonies uh, that the staff provide. These are all things that, again, they're, they're, they're different procedures, but they're the same basic idea of, of reinforcing, using positive reinforcement to reward our clients for treatment adherence. And they are all empirically supported options uh, for using contingency management. So I think one of the take home messages I hope to impart today to those in the treatment community is that you are living in a buyer's market, that you have choices or things you can choose among. And I would just uh, encourage those of you who are considering contingency management, to go into it with an open mind and think about how, how contingency management principles might be used to address your local needs with your local resources. In terms of kind of a spine of uh, core tenets that, that wed all of these contingency management approaches together, there's three simple, simple ideas here. One is that you have an, a, a, a targeted behavior that reflects treatment adherence and that you're going to monitor your client's behavior. And when they, perform, when they demonstrate that behavior, you provide them a tangible reinforcer. And if they don't demonstrate the behavior, you withhold the reinforcement. Really simple ideas. But by and large, what 50 years of study will suggest about this is that if you adhere to those three principles, you can expect about a half a standard deviation of clinical benefit in your patient population. Now, some out there may be saying, well, what the heck does that mean? Uh, I'll say again, and I see the question in the chat box, so I'll try to answer it, I guess, here, uh, which is to say that in, a, in the example of Evergreen Treatment Services, where we uh, targeted counseling attendance, we saw a 15% increase, 15% increase in counseling attendance, and that equated to an effect size of 0.53, or just about a half a standard deviation of clinical benefit. So let's take a look at this collective evidence, because there may still be some naysayers out there. And we want to do that from a 30,000-foot view. We've got more than four decades of effectiveness data here. And so that, what that allows us to do is look at mean effect sizes as reported in meta-analyses. And when we look at 19 trials of Nancy Petrie's fishbowl uh, procedure, we see a mean effect size reported of just under 0.5 or, or just under a half a standard deviation of clinical benefit on average. When we look at privilege-based CM, so protocols probably done in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but still 30 trials conducted, we see a mean effect size of 0.52. 
And third, we see the voucher-based CM, based again on 30 protocols or 30 trials done probably in the 90s and early 2000s. And in effect, say it's slightly higher, but I'm not sure many would make a whole lot of the difference in those numbers there. And I think what I would offer from 30,000 feet is that the height of those uh, the, the height of those bars on the bar graph there are not terribly dissimilar. And I think this tells us two things. First off, that contingency management works. We know roughly how well it works, and that it works pretty comparably across diverse methodologies. And again, I think what this provides those in the treatment community is a database rationale for customizing contingency management protocols to your local needs and resources. So how might you do that? Well, I think there's a few things to consider. Um, I'm going to skip over this for sake of time, but this is a little dose of the diffusion of innovations uh, uh, content that Todd uh, mentioned in his opening and some, some aspects or some components that tend to um, predict greater adoption of new ideas. One of the things you can customize is who you make uh, eligible for the contingency management programming. So you want to make sure you have a well-defined population. That might be your entire patient census, or it might be a particular subgroup. But one way or the other, the other you want to make sure that you have a well-defined population so that your patients or clients know who is eligible for this thing. You also want to think about who you want in, in whom you want to increase engagement in your treatment processes. And those are the people you want to offer contingency management to. Costs are also something to consider, and you know, the size of the group you target will certainly have, have an influence or correspond with your overall implementation costs. And I guess just to bring this to life a little bit, I'll offer two examples of organizations I came in contact with at uh, different points over the last decade, I remember uh, a, an intensive outpatient program in Maryland that was putting together a stepped care model. And so again, that's the idea that people would be rewarded for adherence by a progression into a, a more lenient or, or lesser uh, uh, treatment phase with lesser requirements and more autonomy. But that was something that they felt it was very important to offer to everybody. And so they offered that their, their client eligibility was their entire client census. In contrast, I remember an opiate treatment program based in Texas where they very narrowly focused on pregnant and parenting women who were starting on opiate agonist medication. They did this because they really had um, a commitment to provide great care for that particular subgroup of clientele. They wanted to make sure that they were increasing the engagement of these women during their pregnancy to improve prenatal care and uh, agonist medication adherence and so this, that, that informed their decisions. But again, two different clinics doing di very different things, but doing what made uh, perfect sense according to their local needs. Another customizable feature is the behavior that you target for reinforcement. So there's a few things you want to do. You want to make sure that this is an observable behavior. You don't want to rely on client self-report. You want to make sure there's a clear outcome, something that does or doesn't happen, whether that's a counseling visit that is or isn't attended, or a urinalysis result that is drug positive or drug negative. Those are two common examples. There are probably others. You also want to choose something that's clinically meaningful. Um, I think sometimes other considerations can come into play, and I'll offer the example of a uh, treatment program, a nonprofit organization that I worked with in the southeastern United States that looked, um, looked at their uh, reimbursement streams and saw that they got a disproportionate level of reimbursement through group therapy attendance. Now, group therapy attendance is observable, and it has a clear outcome, and it's clinically meaningful. But for this particular clinic, it was an opportunity to implement contingency management and to do so in a way that wound up providing not, over, not only the budgetary surplus to allow themselves to cover, uh, entirely cover the implementation costs, but also provided a budgetary surplus to expand other services to their clientele. So I'll make crystal clear this was a nonprofit organization doing, doing so, uh, but this was a creative and opportunistic use of customized uh, contingency management programming. A third customizable feature is, uh, is the reinforcers that are used. 
And so you want to use things that your clients will value, and a great way to find out what that is or, or what they value is to ask them, whether you do that with a patient advisory board or do a straw poll at the end of your group therapy sessions or send out a survey to your clients, but there's lots of great ways for, to get their input as to the types of things that might serve as valuable rein, reinforcers or rewards. I think that can also lead you to come up with a whole range of comparable ideas. And if you have a range of reinforcers from which individuals can choose, that just raises the value or incentive magnitude of their individual choices uh, and makes the whole thing just work all the, all the, much, all the more better. Uh, I think there's also you know, other, other local considerations that bear on this sometime, and I guess that's the example I'll offer of, of a clinic also in the southeastern United States an opiate treatment program that was in a rural area or served a really large rural catchment area and had a lot of, uh, a lot of clients that were using public transportation uh, and others that had private vehicles, but they knew that transportation was an issue and a barrier to long-term retention of their clients. And so when they were choosing reinforcers, they made sure that gas cards and uh, uh, bus passes were among the options for rewards that people could earn. They weren't the only options, but they were certainly among the options for reinforcers that were, were made available, and that was, again, informed by local needs. Finally, you have a customizable set of choices around the reinforcement system itself. And so I think what I would suggest to people in the treatment community is that they think about their existing service structure and think about how to make things compatible with the recurrent contacts that already occur in your programming between staff and clients. Contingency management delivery, kind of the communication elements I mentioned earlier, is something that can be done in roughly five to seven minutes um, it's something that can be layered on top of other types of therapeutic uh, services that are, that are being offered, whether that's motivational interviewing or cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy or what have you. This is something that, is, that can be nicely layered on top of that without much time or effort. It's something that a lot of protocols can be done in group uh, sessions or in individual sessions. And one of, the, one of the things we know from research is that staff will better implement the contingency management uh, procedures if they can directly see the clinical benefits that their clients experience and, and have that corrective experience of, of the clients uh, able to earn something um, for their hard work um, in, uh, in, in forging treat, treatment adherence. You also want to keep in mind that you've got other uh, systems involved in your clinic operation. So from a billing perspective, you want to make sure that there's a way to account for the purchase and distribution of material rewards to your clients. From a record keeping perspective, you want to make sure that you also have a documentation set up um, that enables you to document when uh, target behaviors are achieved and when rewards are delivered to clients. And a bigger, broader point is, probably goes back to the Everett Rogers stuff, is keep things simple for, for your staff. Um, some of these protocols are really well intended, but you can, you can see from reading about them that they're quite complicated and time consuming. Some of them involve a great deal of math or can involve a great deal of math, and you may have very bright people working for you or beside you at your treatment agency, uh, quite capable of doing long division and all kinds of difficult computational math, but I suspect very few of them got into the addiction treatment field and, and into helping professions more generally to spend their afternoons doing that. So make the procedures simple for them. Certainly if you have options to make it simpler to do that and enlist your staff in discussions about how to, how to simplify the procedures. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here with some broader considerations, and I think this ties into Dr. Molfenter's uh, discussion earlier, with any systems change effort, I think you want to elicit perspectives from a range of stakeholders, including your staff, managers, uh, clients, and community members. You want to collect baseline information, whether that's retrospective or prospectively done, but you want to understand the problem you're trying to address. I'll also say that Doing that will probably give you a pretty good 
uh, sense of what half a standard deviation of clinical benefit might be in your particular locale. Uh, you also want to start small. I usually suggest that people have a provisional implementation period, and I usually suggest about 90 days for that. That's enough time for people to get to know the procedures and have some implementation experience, and yet it's still short enough time where they can course correct uh, and um, uh, kind of work with a program to, to modify procedures to make them more usable. And then finally, you want to enlist a subject matter expert for consultation. An outside perspective can be very helpful with these kinds of system change efforts. And I just encourage people to look for subject matter experts that might have an open mind about how to help you customize programming uh, to your particular setting. I'm going to wrap up here with just a mention of an upcoming online training product that the Northwest ATTC will be offering in this area. You see the title down there below um, mentioned that this will be in the Healthy Knowledge Portal, we hope, in October. This, like everything there, is open source, and it's, so it's free to the public. There may be a brief registration process, but uh, uh, I, I think this is a, a great service and, and probably gives you access to 85 or 90 other online training products that exist in that portal. That will be coming soon. And I think we'll expand on a lot of the ideas that you've heard me talk about today. I'll also say that the regional ATTCs are also a place to go for technical assistance. And for those of you who are in Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, or Washington, the Northwest ATTC certainly invites you to contact us at the information provided there if you're looking for technical assistance uh, or um, assistance of any kind with contingency management. Um, so again, I, I thank the audience for their uh, attention today. We will be answering questions at a later point, I understand, and so we'll be having an opportunity to, to respond to some of the questions I see in the chat box. But I think I will step aside at this point and let my uh, colleague and co-director at the North, Northwest ATTC, Dina Vandersloot, talk a little bit about uh, the matrix model. Thank you very much. That was really good information. Um, our next speaker is Dina Vandersloot, who is the co-director of the Northwest ATTC at the University of Washington. Um, she draws on 25 years of experience as a clinician, researcher, trainer, and consultant in the behavioral health field to assist individuals and organizations to improve their clinical and organizational practices and processes. She provides training and technical assistance in evidence-based adoption and implementation in a variety of behavioral health interventions and organizational change practices, including process improvement, motivational interviewing, expert recovery-oriented systems of care, and integration of health systems. Her passion is coaching individuals and organizations to achieve their full potential and provide exceptional care to patients. Welcome. And we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, and good morning, or I guess it's good afternoon for many of you. I'm going to be talking about uh, implementing the matrix model of treatment based on uh, an experience I had in implementing it in a treatment organization several years ago and being part of the first uh, kind of major set of clinical trials around the matrix model. Maybe um, <clears throat> sharing a little bit about how I came to be part of that project. Um, not a lot on any of the details about the outcome, a little bit about that, but also then talking about the implementation considerations around specific treatment components of the matrix model and some of the lessons that we learned and then kind of wrapping up with talking about some resources if you're interested in learning more or wanting to implement the matrix model. So this is actually where uh, my uh, kind of journey uh, and introduction to the matrix model occurred. Uh, this is a picture, well, not necessarily on the plus, but uh, this is a picture of uh, Billings, Montana. It was uh, 1998, and we were in the throes of the methamphetamine epidemic at the time. Um, I was working at a treatment agency called the South Central Mental Health Organization, 
And we applied to be part of a grant to participate in the clinical trials for the methamphetamine treatment project. And so this was really my introduction to the matrix model. And um, it, there were seven different treatment sites, um, I think around 970 individuals uh, participated in this study. And we were really looking and comparing the treatment as usual to the matrix model of treatment. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details, but what we did find is that um, when using the matrix model in comparison to treatment as usual, uh, people tended to stay in treatment longer. And they were able to maintain um, continuous abstinence over a longer period of time. Most of the effects we found actually happened during the treatment experience or the improvements. So um, anyway, and you know, one of the goals was, of course, to test the effectiveness. But another one was really to take a look at what does it take to implement the matrix model in a community-based treatment um, facility. And so that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, here you have the matrix treatment components. And um, in the second uh, webinar of this series, Regina Fox talks about, you know, more about the matrix model itself. So I'm really going to talk about these more as they relate to if you're thinking of implementing the matrix model, what are some considerations uh, to be thinking about? Um, before I delve into that, though, I thought it might be helpful to see a sample schedule. Uh, the matrix model of treatment is really uh, developed to be an intensive outpatient treatment model. It's been adapted. Um, one of the individuals, I spoke to a few different individuals as I was preparing for this who have recently implemented matrix. Uh, one person by the name of Sheila Wex who has recently implemented it in, a, it in an FQHC is doing it more on an outpatient one time a week basis. So it can definitely be adapted. Um, oftentimes, people also use it in residential treatment. But this gives you a sense of what the schedule looks like um, if you're using it in an intensive outpatient setting. So some implementation considerations um, relative to this. One important one, and you know, these are based on some of my lessons learned in talking with others recently. Kind of, they, they all seem to kind of line up, as well as the other six sites at the time that we originally did the original study, they were fairly common that these were some of the things that we noticed as implementing matrix. One thing is that um, there are individual, um, what more than individual sessions, really conjoint sessions with family members. And you know, oftentimes that I hear this still a lot about, it's really hard to engage family members. Oftentimes, um, Family members are, are really um, frustrated and may not want to be part of the treatment experience. And so having clinicians who are really skilled with working with families is important. And you know, I know part of it is, you know, do these individuals even have family members or significant others in their life to involve? But what we really found, too, was some of that had to do with the comfort level of the counselors in working with families. So if you're thinking of implementing this, you know, the Matrix Institute, uh, which uh, originated or is in Los Angeles, California, a lot of their therapists, at least at the time that I was an active part of this project, um, had backgrounds in marriage and family. So they were very comfortable working with individuals and with families. And so, you know, thinking about having somebody with skills for working with families can be an important consideration. Um, with the early recovery groups and the relapse prevention groups, some considerations, the early recovery groups are from weeks one through four, and they're really giving people the core skills to help them maintain sobriety. And an important component of these groups, both of early recovery and relapse prevention, is to have co-leaders <clears throat> for these groups. And at the time that we did this, um, co-leaders are peers who, you know, ideally have gone through the matrix model of treatment, have successfully completed treatment, and are um, really in recovery, or at least early recovery. 
And so they bring that component to the group of being able to talk about how mutual aid groups have helped them. Um, they can support others in attending 12-step uh, groups. What we found, it was really a struggle to get people um, who were willing to volunteer their time to do this. And so one of the things as I was going through this that I kind of got excited about was that, um, excuse me just a sec, I have a call trying to come into my phone and I need to, uh, oops, there. So I don't know if you can hear that beeping or not. Anyway, um, so one of the things for this was I was thinking, you know, people who have peer support specialists or recovery coaches, that would be a great role as a co-leader of these groups. Um, so that was something that was a, definitely a challenge for us. Another challenge that um, a couple of people I just recently talked to is this idea, and this goes back to um, what both Todd and Brian were talking about earlier, was staff buy-in. and you know, um, the switching from more of maybe an open group type of, of um, facilitation to using a manual to guide groups can sometimes be a challenge for counselors. And, you know, it seems, I think sometimes the perception is that it's easier to do a manual-based treatment, but it really does take skill to take the material to make it come alive for group members, to help them actively engage with the material and share their experiences. And so having somebody who really has good skills for delivering more of a psychoeducational group is really key to this particular approach, I think. The family education sessions, these are really key to the whole model. And so once again, having family members and being able to engage family members um, is really important. There are videos, and, I'm, and a little bit later I'm going to talk about um, where you can obtain the materials. There are three key videos that really go over the core concepts in Matrix and help people understand the stages of recovery from stimulant use disorder. They also talk about, you know, why are they learning exactly what they're learning and the skills that they're learning. So the videos are really important. So making sure that you obtain copies of these videos can be really essential. Social support groups, these are actually kind of, I know what we might typically think more of as aftercare or continuing care groups. One thing that um, many of the sites uh, found that it was hard to initiate these groups when you're just starting to implement Matrix because they really depend on people who have had some um, experience with recovery, some long-term recovery to support those who are early in recovery. And so they're, in many ways they're alumni groups. So you know, one strategy might be to pull other alumni um, individuals into this group who may not necessarily have gone through the matrix treatment, but who have been in, you know, have some period of recovery. So that was a little bit of a challenge to actually um, get in place. And the final uh, treatment component that I wanted to just touch base on really quickly is this idea of drug or urine uh, testing. And that in the matrix model, it is really seen as a clinical tool, not a punitive tool in any way. And so one of the things that we ran into and we were successful with is we were able to have, um, we had a community group, advisory group, uh, as we were doing this, partly because it was a research project, so a little different than if you're just implementing this. But we had one and we were able to work with probation and parole so that they would allow, they wouldn't ask for us to release the information. They would do their own um, drug testing and we could do ours. So it really became a way to help people if they were having positive UAs to talk about what was working or not working for them and what they might need. Um, and this is another one that can be tricky to actually implement because it, there is a cost factor to it. Um, but it really is an essential piece. Uh, of, the, of the treatment model. So finding maybe if insurance or uh, your funders don't uh, pay for this, how, how might you actually get that funded is something to consider. So those are kind of lessons learned relative to individual components. 
some lessons, kind of more general lessons learned, in cre um, include this idea of creating staff buy-in is so essential. Um, so as Todd had talked about, having a change team, having people actively involved in the process is really important. Um, also in involving community partners, as I talked about just a minute ago, in this process, so other health care providers, probation and parole, child welfare, um, as you're implementing something new, having your key stakeholders being involved can be helpful. Another piece is motivational interviewing is an important foundational skill for the matrix model. And so um, it can be really helpful for people either before or once they've been trained in matrix to also have some MI. Um, maybe they've already had some in the past, but maybe some refresher MI training can be helpful. And this is kind of maybe a number one lesson learned. And uh, Sheila Weck, who I talked to, really talked about having a strong clinical supervisor who can support the skills and help people really learn how to do, it, someone who is familiar with Matrix, who can help and really mentor and coach and provide the ongoing training. Um, one thing that we found too is group dynamics can be affected. We were people's primary diagnosis was stimulant use disorder, methamphetamine use disorder. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so, and of course, that's not the only uh, 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 use disorder that they were actually having, but it was often the primary. And so when you had more mixed groups in our treatment as usual with people who might have alcohol use disorder, you had a little bit of a different group dynamic. And we found that that was, it was difficult sometimes to sustain um, a group cohesion um, with all individuals who all had stimulant use disorder. Um, another consideration is gender specific groups. In just a minute here, I'm going to show you the different adaptations of matrix. So um, you might want to consider if you have women groups, there's a women specific manual. Um, and you know, I like this as a kind of to wrap this up was to really use a change management strategy and hold the course. So there is training, but of course, that is just one component of a change management strategy. So really kind of using the implementation tools. Um, so there are a couple different um, sources for obtaining the matrix manual. Um, and uh, one is through SAMHSA website, which I left out the S on this, I just noticed. Um, but these are free. You can download them. You can see here on this slide the different manuals that are available. Um, they are um, public domain, so they're free, um, and they can be translated and adapted. Now, the videos at one time were available on the website, but I wasn't able to access them the last time that I checked, and so that might be a downside. The other source is the Hazelden Matrix Manuals. Of course, there is a cost for these. Um, the hard copies can be purchased. The key videos are available through this. And um, I guess one of the probably um, maybe benefits of this particular um, version is that the broader language includes all drugs and alcohols, not just stimulant specific. Um, but it is under copyright and isn't in the public domain. Um, but as you can see here, we have the link so that you can learn more about that. Um, here is a kind of a list of some of the manualized adaptations that the Matrix Institute, which is now called Clear Matrix actually, um, that they have done around the matrix model so and where you can um, obtain information. So some of them are available through the SAMHSA website. Um, and others are available through Hazelden. One that I just want to quickly note here is there are some new manuals or updated core matrix manual on the Hazelden um, that includes a section on medication-assisted treatment. I haven't actually seen that, but I, I think that would be really helpful to have. And, you know, if you're interested in training, um, the primary um, organization that I'm aware of is Claire Matrix that provides the training. I obtained this information off their website, um, and so um, hopefully it's accurate. But if you go on their website, I mean, they have some that are available that they provide kind of open trainings in Los Angeles. I know they also do some training that's specific for organizations. 
Um, and there may be others providing it, but that's kind of the key people. Um, they do a basic two-day training, and then they do a key supervisory training um, for, um, for the supervisors to gain additional information and skill development from kind of mentoring and coaching others. And um, uh, I know we're not doing questions here, but please type in your questions if you have them. Um, and I also, uh, in the slides, there's some resources and references. So um, if you want additional information. And I think we're at the top of the hour. So thank you, everybody, for um, being on the webinar. And hopefully you found a resource or two that will be helpful. Thank you so much. All really, really great information. Um, I just want to remind people that um, we have a couple minutes. If you want to just put some questions in the chat box, I will be sure and um, forward them on. There will be an FAQ document um, along with the slides and um, the recording of this webinar. It will be on both of the um, ATTC websites. So it will probably take a couple of weeks, but um, go ahead and check back in. And again, if you have any other questions, please um, put them in the chat box. And I just want to thank everyone, our speakers, um, our producer, and all of you who listened. Thank you.